Okay. So, um, yeah, uh, what voice acting is, it's interesting because I get a lot of people who will say to me, um, yeah, you know, people tell me I've got a really great voice, I should get into voice acting. And frankly, that's about five to 10% of the whole package. Uh, okay, maybe you inherited a Stradivarius, but do you know how to play it? That's what this is all about. Um, what good voice acting is when it's done right is one of the harder forms of acting because most acting is in a scene with other people and when you're in your booth by yourself you got nobody there but you right so um one of the things that you have to do is uh think of this as you being what what your purpose is in that moment and like a lot of the stuff that we see on the voices.com site um you know it's not it's not shakespeare <laughs> but it still is acting even if we're just talking about you know how to fill out compliance forms or how to you know uh, or you know a new gym membership or whatever the the job happens to be what you've been done, you, you have the opportunity to be the conduit for somebody else's really important message. And that's, a, that's, that's, a, that's something that's very valuable. Um, okay, now how am I gonna do this? Let's see. Oh yeah, I can go like that. Um, so what you need to do is you want to um, think of the consumer and think uh, like the, actually the person who's listening to the message and think of your client as um, a, a dating service and you're the app that puts them together. You're the conduit for their very important message that needs to be given and the very important message that needs to be received. Okay, so um, what we're going to cover today are, um, uh, do you need an acting background? A little bit about organic preparation technical preparation, observation, integration, and a secret sauce. So what does that mean? Um, uh, organic, uh, do you need an acting background? Uh, not necessarily. You don't need to have uh, gone to acting school, although it certainly helps. But what you can do is you can do what all actors do. Because when you, when you have an acting background and you've gone to theater school, it never stops there. It's a craft. And so actors are taught from the, like, you know, as they leave school, great, you've got your foundation. Now, keep working, keep polishing, keep learning more about the craft because it changes, adding to what you have. So uh, I typically say, and a lot of people do too, that you should come up with a percentage and a good rule of thumb is like 5% of whatever you make each year, you should reinvest in your craft. Um, so uh, that this means that you can do things like, you know, you can go to uh, workshops like this, you can read books, you can find out whatever's free online and you can also attend workshops. You can take classes, you can coach with someone um, when we talk about organic preparation, that's linked with discovering ways, shortcuts, I call them, to um, building a believable world in which you are the speaker of the words you're about to say, right? These are not your words. They're someone else's words. And our job is to make them sound like they're our words. So naturalism in acting actually began about 100 years ago with Stanislavski when he said, wait a minute, wait a minute, we need to make sure that this doesn't sound like real people talking on stage. They're very theatrical. And we want to make them, you know, so he went through, a, initiated a course of acting discovery that uh, talked about naturalism. And then it changed again. It shifted in the 50s with James Dean. And he introduced a whole new wave of naturalism. And the cool thing is now what we're seeing in uh, the voiceover world is it's our turn to embrace naturalism. 15, 20 years ago saying, um, welcome to the course on e-learning module, blah, blah, blah. Like that kind of very cadenced, uh, very measured uh, announcey stuff was okay. It's not anymore. So now it's our turn to learn, embrace realism. Uh, how, many, how many times have you seen a spec on voices.com? What, 85% of the time perhaps where it says real person? conversational, believable, all that kind of stuff. A knowledge of technical tools helps you identify what's not working in your reads on a technical level and how to correct them. And then observation, that actually gets into kind of like, you know, your childhood when you were a little kid, right? You played, you mimicked. 
um, these are some of the acting tools that we use all the time in voiceover acting. So, um, okay, I kind of jumped around here. Do you need to go to school? Not really, but you do need to continually stay abreast of changes in the market. Um, so be on the lookout for opportunities, blogs. I blog all over the place. Check out my site for blogs. Um, Voices.com blogs all the time about voice acting. Great source of information. Interviews. Another thing you can do is purposefully consume media. We'll talk about that in a bit. Um, now, acting is about observation and expression. So um, in, when I was in theater school, one of the things they used to do is give us an assignment where we would go and we would actually find a person to mimic, observe and mimic, and then come back and act out a scene like them. This is actually helpful. This is a helpful exercise for you to be able to do it from a voiceover perspective. So that means observe other people around you, right? I mean, uh, we think of, you don't necessarily think of yourself as a character, but I'll bet you there's someone in your family who you think, oh yeah, that person's a character, right? We, none of us think that we are characters, but we all are. And if you take a look at any actor that you know, um, Kristen Wiig, um, Morgan Freeman, uh, J Alice and Janney, Emma Stone, uh, Tom Hanks, you can, you can do an imitation of them because even in their baseline as just a person, they're a character, right? So start to observe and express the characters around you in a naturalistic way. Um, another thing that is really important in terms of acting skills and voiceover is your connection. I've heard time and time again from casting directors and other people in the industry um, who go through um, scripts. And I'm sure Kyle, the, the, the voiceover team at uh, the voices.com team is the same. Um, 80% of the time, this is the stat, 80% of the time when an actor doesn't book a gig, it's because they haven't connected with the script or they haven't connected with the people in the scene. AKA for us, that's the people we're talking to, the people that we're sending the message to. Um, I also have a little blurb here down, your own unique art and expression. So your own mass magic, um, how do you express yourself? How do you tell your stories and uh, why aren't you bringing that into your work? Or when I was in theater school at the University of Windsor, um, we had an amazing teacher there, Vance Johnson, I think his name was. And we were all hanging out in the, in the hall, you know, just carrying on like acting students will, being dramatic and everything. And he came to us and said, why are you people not bringing one iota of that magic and that expression into my scene study class? And we were like, Oh yeah, because when we got into scene study class, we were like all of a sudden very wooden, right? So it's bringing you and the way you tell stories into this work here. Okay. Oh yeah, this is a good quote. That's your job as an actor to understand the human part of the character to make it real done by the God, the grandfather, the God, the godfather of, of voiceover, right? Morgan Freeman. So um, don't think of, of the voiceover as a character that you would play in a movie or uh, the, your, the idea of a character is just you. It's your crazy Aunt Hilda, your kid, um, anybody. We're all characters and, and we all are human. And so the cool thing about acting is it's the lens is looking at humanity. You're looking at how we express ourselves and then how to interpret that. Okay. Um, an actor prepares. Um, to, okay, so there's, I like to talk about it in terms of organic perform, performance orientation. So organic stuff and technical stuff. So the organic stuff is all kind of like head, heart. Actually, it's more heart, but it's like you think about it before you can engage the heart. Whereas the technical stuff is more like, where, where's my, my, my lips, where's my breath, where, you know, that kind of stuff. We'll get to that in a minute. Um, so the first thing you wanna do is um, research the part. Um, so uh, whether it's a play or it's a voiceover, uh, you look at the script, you look at the specs, 
um, you think, uh, who, who, who might they be? Who might this person be? Who, who is this person? Who's, who's the, the guy who's giving me the job? Uh, what are their target demographic? Um, you might want to research the company. Um, where are they located? Who are they talking to? What's their brand? Um, I, I also teach in a college and I talk, uh, teach about gaming and in, in gaming, there's, it's so rife with NDAs. You're given so little information about the character that you're about to portray. It's all organic preparation. Um, so yeah, what's the company's brand? Are they a, a buttoned up international fintech organization or a down-home regional transport company that's uh, located in the Midwest? The more you can find out about beyond just what's in the spec itself, but if the company too, that will also help inform the, your, approach to, uh, your approach to the work. Um, analyzing the text. So uh, we get a lot of really great job opportunities on voices.com. Some come with really great targeted specs that make our, our jobs easier, narrow the field, give us some constraints within which to play. And some come with no specs, no gender, no tags, uh, it's wide open. Uh, so how do you go for clues when, on how to deliver a knockout read on something like that? Well, first you look at the script. Um, so how you connect with the script, it's really, really important. Um, so many people open their mouths before they're ready. They haven't, they, they maybe read it once and then they just dive in. It's like, do you understand what this thing is about? Do you know what you're talking about? So many people I've worked with, well, like they'll, they'll give me a read and it's like, okay, what was that about that you just read? Well, I don't know. <laughs> it's like, okay, well, let's dive in for meaning then. So you check out each line. You spend a little bit more time coming up with this script than you, you think you need to. Because like the people who wrote the script, how long did they spend on it? More than five minutes, more than a day, probably a week, maybe even longer. So each line is there for a reason. So you have to unlock that reason to be able to help, you know, squeeze out the juice, the importance. Are you introducing a problem? In the case of explainers, you know, there's that kind of, you know, persona, right? That meet Jane, Jane has a problem. Jane's life sucks. If only Jane could do blah, blah, blah. Um, hey, Jane, we've got your solution. That's a persona that what they're doing, the purpose of that and that structure is to be able to uh, introduce to somebody the idea that, um, oh, here's someone who has a problem. Maybe she's just like you. And that's what they're hoping, right? That they've introduced or created this little persona Jane that the other person can identify with and say, oh, wow, Jane's life changed. Maybe my can, mine can too. Um, so your intention. Um, yeah. The next thing we want to talk about is discovering the subtext. So this is the missing link for most people with no ba acting background. Um, it's what is the meaning behind the words? So for example, if the, if the text is, I love you, you could say it like, I love you. Or you could say it like, I, I love you. Or you could say it like, I, I love you, right? You could like, you know, there's so many things like real love. I put up with you love or uh, you've driving me crazy love. Um, so we have to find what is the unspoken or less obvious meaning behind the words. That is what will lift your performances up off the page. Um, linked with the subtext is um, intentions. So actors are taught not to act emotions like upbeat, happy, sad, um, serious, nothing like that. Actors are taught because what, what that does, guys, is that keeps it all internal. Actors are taught to act intentions. So what is my intent? Because, right, we, what is my intention in giving you this information? Right now, as I'm talking to you, my intention is to inform, share, uh, inspire, um, and, you know, hopefully interest you in this whole idea of acting in voice acting. That's my intention. Um, now, that's easier, and, and that makes it more interesting because it's an outgoing kind of a feeling. It's me to you, it's me to somebody else. As opposed to if I were just to think, I'm gonna be upbeat. And it's like, okay, so I'm upbeat, but it's like that keeps it 
manu it's a little manufactured and it it doesn't it keeps it focused on me rather than focused on the person that you're actually talking to. So intention, acting intentions is really, really an important part of, again, lifting those performances up off the page and making them really make an impact on the person that you're talking to. And then lastly, organic performance, we talk about um, world building. Okay, so it's filling in the details. It's like you're not a talking voice, a disembodied voice, it, existing in nothing. There's a whole world around you. Even if you're talking about something that, you know, like, I don't know, IT or medical stuff or whatever, there's, there's a, a reason and there's a world around you that you can connect to, to again, make it more important, more impactful. Um, now, uh, okay. So where are you? Where are you? Like, imagine who you're talking to and where are you? Are you in Starbucks with a, with a, with a friend and you're just having a conversation? Are you in front of a, a, an audience of 2000 people asking them to please take their seats? Are you um, um, at a conference and you're explaining this really cool new Oculus product or something like that? helping to put you in that situation and sort out where you are geographically and also what happened just before. Did someone, you know, question you? Did someone challenge you? Did someone ask you your opinion? What happened just before and just after so that your energy doesn't drop off at the end of a performance? That also will really help you uh, make it sound good. All right, um, let's talk about uh, technical stuff. So we call it technical preparation because it has less to do with the emotional, inspirational component and more to do with technique, uh, listening and uh, imitation. So the first thing, um, care, instrument care, right? Okay, so yeah, maybe you've inherited that Stradivarius. You wanna take care of it. You want to hydrate all the time. Um, good buddy of mine who's an audiobook uh, uh, narrator uh, says he doesn't start his day without having had two liters or almost two quarts of water before he even opens his mic. And then he'll have another six after that to be able to talk throughout the day. We have to protect this. So also, you know, experiment with your own self. I know for me, for example, I limit dairy when I'm working because it, it, it affects me. Uh, I have uh, like a very small coffee first thing in the morning when I first wake up and then I don't have any more coffee. On the weekends, I'll have two coffees, but I limit my caffeine intake. Um, so um, also, you know, like taking care of yourself physically, uh, making sure that you do get out of the booth and move around, right? Uh, that sort of thing. Um, oh yeah, what are your paint brushes, your paints and brushes? Your, for us, if okay, if we were visual artists, we would be using paints, brushes, you know, um, rocks. Uh, I don't know what other visual artists do. Uh, what are our tools to work with? They're words, ideas, concepts. So you must be an amateur, a lover of language, and study it. Study sentences. Study paragraphs. Read all the time, out loud and to yourself. Um, Cold reading is something that I talk about all the time. I have an actual specific course on help, helping somebody um, increase their read rate. So for example, if it takes you um, three hours to read a one hour text, I teach you how to limit that down to one and a half hours. It takes, it takes a while to be able to do it, but it can be done. Um, then music in the voice and genre. Okay, so again, this is technical, a technical approach to performance. Um, we, people don't often think that uh, the spoken voice has music, but it does, right? And in fact, if I just said, if I, if I just repeat what I just said there, but it does. If I was going to sing that, it would be la la la, la la la, right? Okay, so our spoken word has just as much music as our singing voice. And so you can start to kind of hear what works and what doesn't work. I teach, being Canadian, I have a lot of uh, winter references. And so some of the things that I talk about are like 
toboggan runs versus moguls in reeds. Example of a toboggan run would be McDonald's is going to give you a cup of coffee and you're going to love it. You hear how the music went up and then down as opposed to a mogul where, you know, check your reeds for this, guys. This is not a good thing to have moguls in your reeds. Uh, moguls are ski hill bumps like that. Those are those things where if you were talking like an announcer, it would go up and down like that all the time. That's a mogul. We want to eliminate those because nobody talks like that in, re in reality, right? So learning about music and the voice and genre, because like I talked about with um, uh, explainers, there's a, you know, meet Jane. Jane has a lot of da, da, da. There's a cadence and a music to some of the work that we do that you can kind of go, okay, well, I want to make sure that I respect that or know that. Same thing with um, uh, answering uh, services, right? IVR. Um, hello, welcome to the blah, 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 blah. It's like, you know, is there's a certain kind of music to that as well. Then there's um, uh, other, other kinds of narration that's wide open. So you can, you know, you can compose the music yourself. And then you have like an energy evaluation. Even the quietest reads need energy. Um, so where, how do you get that? Where do you manufacture that? There are techniques for being able to do that. And in the acting world, one of the organic ways to do that is upping the stakes, making it more important. How can I make sure that this is really important? And it's sort of devising ways around your, in your head, manufacturing ways in your head to make this particular text about compliance or legal stuff more important, really important right now. Um, technically, you can do it through um, exercises through for, for your diaphragm and um, uh, something that I call learning how to do the pressure cooker, uh, which helps, again, amp up that energy, make it nice and smooth. Um, okay, what's my time here? Um, oh, I turned my phone off so I wouldn't get. What time is it, uh, Kyle? Am I? Oh, sorry, I was muted. Um, we are looking at 12.25, so we've got about- um, Okay, perfect, perfect. 20 minutes. Okay, perfect, okay. Good, I was like speeding through this. <laughs> <laughs> everything. <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay, no so, okay, great. So um, let's talk about observation. Um, okay, so observation, these are, okay, so when I was in school, uh, they would, like I mentioned, they said, go out and go out and look, go out and watch people. And um, so where can you find and be inspired by people? The people around you, your friends, your neighbors, your family. Um, is there a particular accent in your in your part of the world is there an accent in the last place perhaps that you visited or that you lived in that you want to be able to bring um and beyond that there's also like different people have different rhythms of being able to speak and that's an interesting way uh, that's an interesting thing to note as well um, I also teach something called intentional viewing. So these are pop culture references and, and you should be up on those. You should always be up on what are, you know, what's, it, what's, what's happening now, uh, whether it's the world of manga or um, what's on streaming devices or whatever. Um, uh, what you do is um, you look at um, these references come to us, you know, like maybe it's a sound alike, like, um, can you please, we want someone, we're thinking of a sound, uh, a sound like this actor or that actor. So there's, there's that aspect to it. But the intentional viewing is also to listen and watch, watch how people and listen, how people act on Netflix, on your favorite streaming show, on a YouTube video, on your favorite YouTuber. Um, how do they engage you? How do they, how do they make you keep pressing play, keep hitting next. How do they keep you engaged? Observe it, grab onto it, incorporate it, use it. That's intentional viewing. So I always say, you know, and I've been saying for years that um, any of my, um, my cable, my internet, all that kind of stuff, I mean, it actually is uh, something that we can deduct from a tax point of view, but it also, because of research, but it's like actually do the research. 
Another thing that you can do um, for observation inspiration, you can do a keyword search for various companies. Um, content creators of e-learning will have, go, go to, you know, do a keyword search, content creators of e-learning in your area or in an area, in your geographic area, or in an area that you want to work in, medical, for example, or IT or um, banks, something like financial. Um, you do a keyword search for the creators of content and you go on their websites and you listen to their portfolio. You, you go, you know, just, it gives you examples of what they're doing. And then again, you can, in an observational way, meaning an oral observational way for us, listen to the people that they hire. There is a gold mine of observation inspiration on voices.com. Right, go to the go to the top one hundred of all time, not the top hundred one hundred of this week, or you know, but of of all time, because these are the people who have been booking and booking and booking, and go and listen to their demos. These are the people that book, so go and hear and listen to what they're doing, and say, oh wow, that worked for them. Now that's something that you want to do with all of this kind of stuff. You want to see what other people have done that has booked. And then you want to turn it around with, with this last bit and you want to incorporate it yourself. So back to when I was in a theater student, I would go over to the Detroit Institute of Art every Thursday afternoon with my mom who happened to be doing her um, degree in art at that point. And uh, I would go there and observe people and she would go there and she would uh, paint sketches of Gauguin, Picasso, Rembrandt, whatever. And I'd say, mom, why do you have to like sketch these guys? Why can't you just sketch what you want to do? Because that's what I was doing, I thought. And she said, no, 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 no. We have to see what others have done in the past, copy it, learn from it, get everything we can, and then do our own spiel, then do our own art. And so that's a really good way that you know, for, for you to do too. You can see, like, like using all of these other references, the goldmine on voices.com, the keyword search, the pop references. And then once you've heard and soaked up what's booking in the world out there, then you can turn it and say, okay, now I want to bring my spin on it, which brings us to the next little slide here. What else can you bring to the work? your secret sauce, <laughs> your you-ness, as I call it, as in Y-O-U-N-E-S-S, -S. you bring your take on the world, right? Everyone is different. Um, you have, uh, but people don't think that they are different. People don't think that they are special, but we all are. You're unique. There's no one like you. I know it's a saying from the 60s or the 70s, but it's like, it's true. Um, no one has had your experiences, comes from your geography, has your culture, even your family culture, your list of hobbies, your education, your age. Um, all of these unique things inform the way you see the world, inform the way you understand the world, and will inform the way you communicate and tell your stories to the world. So then we talk about your storytelling capability. As humans, we are hardwired for story. This is how we learn from our mother's knee to, you know, Mrs. Manili in grade four, teaching us about verbs, to campfires through the ages, to our obsession, our total, total cultural obsession with all forms of entertainment they're all embodied in stories, right? So you are, whether you think of yourself this way or not, you are a storyteller. So dive into your own capability to tell stories. You can capture people's attention. You do so around the table at Thanksgiving. You do so around, you know, um, in, 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 at school with friends. You do so in all forms of life. So bring this to your work. Bring this storytelling capability to your work. Then what are you passionate about? Your heart? What, what, what inflames your heart? What, what, is, what, what makes you kind of go, ah, oh, I could just do this for hours? 
it's voiceover, right? <laughs> yeah, it is for me too. <laughs> but I also love to knit and I also love to cross country ski. So like there's other things, right, that we can bring. And also your insight into humanity from back to number one, your take on the world. Um, you can bring all of that wonderful knowledge that you have to your work. How do we do this when we're talking about something about filling out compliant sheets or something, you know, about uh, the latest cloud service? <laughs> we do. We, we, if you don't understand that, if you don't understand why that cloud service thing is important, you use an acting technique called substitution. So that is when you take that thing that you're so freaking passionate about. Maybe it's building your own canoe out of cedar. I don't know. Um, again, Canadian. Um, you you take that passion. And you bring that into the world of cloud services and you lift, you use that heart, that insight into what you know, and you translate that, you substitute it into that particular script. It really, really makes you sound amazing. And then lastly, your understanding of why we do what we do is so, so very important um, because and it goes back to what I talked about at the beginning. People, someone has an idea. Someone has an idea that they want to share with the world. So much so, so that they have invested money, that they have um, come up with a script, they have shot video or done an animation or something. And they have, now they're looking for someone to tell their story because wise person, they figured out that they're probably not good enough. They're probably not professional enough to tell the story well. So what are they doing? They are looking to hire someone. And so you are in a position of trust, right? They trust you to tell their story. And as much as they need to tell their story, somebody else out there needs desperately to hear it. I was a um, voiceover person for a national uh, pharmacy chain for 25 years. And I would get so excited about Cottonelle bathroom tissue being $2.99 that week. Not because I was manufacturing it, but because I was thinking about the person who it really meant something to. The single mom with five kids or four kids or whatever, who, you know, is trying to stretch her, her dollars is really going to care that Cottonelle bathroom tissue was on at $2.99 this week because maybe it means that she can buy her kid a pair of winter boots, right? So knowing that, the, the stories that we tell, even if it seems, even if the, the person who's up, you know, posted the job saying, I know the words are boring, but try to make them, they're not. There's a reason that they decided to write that. And, and it's unfortunate that the writer hasn't figured that out. You know, every e-learning that is done is because something happened that made this necessary. Maybe it's safety and compliance. Maybe someone got hurt and now they've come up with a safety and compliance thing for this to be able to, it's either about pretty much everything we do <laughs> boils down to your money or your life. Is this going to improve your life or is this going to help save you money, which will improve your life? So it's all about life. And that's that, that, that is the business that we are in, helping people improve their lives, not just voice acting. So this is me, this is my website. And um, as you can see up there in the middle of the, at the top there that says coaching, um, I coach uh, privately. Um, I also coach in groups. Um, uh, and if you want to get in touch with me on that, uh, Kyle has said you can do that. Um, and then I guess that the last thing I wanted to do is just um, make sure that we talk about the best practices, right? Um, going back to that statistic about when you don't book a job, 80% of the, the time you haven't booked a job is because you haven't connected with the message or you haven't connected with the person you're talking to. So make sure that you do. And uh, that is me. Awesome, awesome. Well, that was really great. Uh, I'm really happy that we had the chance to go through that, Kim. I, I know your years of expertise uh, definitely a long way, and you definitely take a much more, um, much more strategic approach, which I'm sure a lot of people 
appreciate in regards to, you know, breaking everything down and kind of the science mm -hmm. behind what uh, I'm sure started off for a lot of people as maybe, you know, when you're going through each one of these steps, it seems like, you know, in order to do this, maybe each audition will take me, you know, half an hour, which I'm sure, and tell me if I'm wrong, you know, in your life now, you've probably boiled it down to, you know, what, maybe five minutes an audition. It's just so intuitive, right? Yeah, that's it. Because you and, and that's what like I talk about, I'm, I'm all about shortcuts in the booth. And, and that's what like I do rely a lot on my acting technique, my acting background, to be able to get to those shortcuts. Um, because then it's like, okay, it's it's like, uh, it just like once you get it, once you practice it, then yeah, it takes less time. But absolutely, at the beginning, it takes longer. Definitely, definitely no. And, and I think that's, that's great insight. And, you know, when when we're looking you know, starting your craft and, and getting to that point, you know, you do look at these things a little bit more structured and a little bit more technical. And then as time goes on, it becomes second, na second nature. So, you know, I'm, I'm happy that we're able to go through those steps and really kind of break it down. So, um, you know, people who are watching, you know, can hopefully, you know, integrate, you know, certain things that connect well with them. So um, as for the Q&A session, guys, um, we are opening the polls now, <laughs> we'll use that term, and uh, if you guys want to uh, go ahead and, and throw your questions out, we'll try to get through them and uh, get through as many as we can, so uh, I'll give you guys about 30 seconds to start popping them in there, and I will start going through the uh, Q&A session there, and, uh, and we'll get uh, Kim's insight on your guys' personal ones. All righty. So I have a question from Eliza. Um, what's the secret to beginning a script in a conversational read and how will you really know if you're sounding natural and, and not too performing? Like, is there something that you do yourself that, you know, kind of sets you up really well for that, for that initial natural sound? Um, and how do you catch yourself if you get into a little bit more of a, you know, performing sounding, you know, kind of voice? It's, it's actually, it's, it, 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 that's a long answer. <laughs> that's a long answer. <laughs> um, yeah, um, because, because for me, what it, I came from, I came from acting, but I also spent a lot of time in uh, broadcast. So um, I had to break habits before I could get that, you know, conversational style kind of thing. And a lot of it, a lot of it comes down to self-observation, listening to how you tell your stories and then trying to uh, make sure that you do that. The other thing that really, really helps is like I mentioned before is cold reading. If you, you wanna be able to get to the point where you can read words at the same rate and with the same intensity that you can talk. So we talk around 165, 170 words per minute. Uh, and we read, typically narrators read around 145 to 150, a lot slower a lot slower. So you want to be able to move your eyes quickly across the page to be able to get that happening. There's a really great, I love, there's this guy on YouTube, his name is John Windsor Cunningham. And he has, I think it's a video number 19 on his series, uh, where he talks about sight reading for theater actors, but he has an exercise in there that is just as important for voiceover actors. So John Windsor Cunningham, video number 19. Oh, that's awesome. Really, really good that you had some reference material there too. <laughs> I like that. Um, uh, and on to the next. So um, I know off the start, you touched on, um, you know, kind of the newbie in, in the industry, um, you know, that has the great voice. So Doug has a question. Um, further, you have a great voice newbie um, with no acting experience. What would you say are really good initial steps to get into that acting training? What would be a really good starting place? I would say, um, start mining YouTube for everything you can that is free that is out there. Look at look at voices.com channel. Look at um, uh, look at uh, look at the actor studio because um, they have a whole bunch of you know in uh, actors talking about acting. You'll learn so much from that. Um, you can take courses. Um, I do a really great six week workshop for uh, people where it's like 12 hours of practice. Uh, over six weeks, 90 minutes a session kind of thing. And um, that's a really great arena. There are a lot of other really good coaches out there that do the same kind of thing. Um, uh, read books, Sanford Meisner technique, um, Uta Hagen, um, some of the more recent ones, like those are the ones that I went, I read when I was in school kind of thing. 
but I mean, there's a lot of like, there's a lot of really great information backstage, get, um, you know, mindbackstage.com for acting techniques, acting ideas. Um, and then once you're ready, you know, find a good coach and practice, practice with them. Definitely. That's awesome. Um, and I've got, uh, one that I think is good for both of us to answer. So I'll get your take on it first. Um, is it best to audition right away when you get, um, when you get an audition, say through voices, if you get an audition through voices, um, do you audition right away or do you spend a lot of time analyzing the script? And, uh, if you see a lot of people are responding, um, do you even bother submitting, um, what's your kind of, you know, kind of game plan on that? That's a great question. So I always think that the earlier that you can get it in, the better. From the point of view, of, uh, I have done casting myself. And uh, so it's basically what you're listening to, for when you're casting is you're listening for the benchmark. So you listen, listen, listen. Oh, that one was good. Okay, then everybody after that has to beat the benchmark. So if you can get in there in the first five to 10, great. Now, that being said, you don't want to sacrifice, you know, speed for performance because performance wins all the time. Performance is the thing that is going to actually win you the job. So, yeah, yeah, no, I, I think I think you kind of put a really good balance in there because it, it's not one or the other. It's not, you know, end all be all of, of just one. It is a balance. I mean, it will always be true. The sooner, the better. Um, it will always be, you know, exactly that. You want to be that benchmark. You want them to connect with you as quickly as possible um, to set yourself apart. Because if you're the first one they remember, or, or even the second one they remember, you're, you're fresh in their mind. Um, definitely getting in there fast is, is very important. Um, and especially on voices.com with regards to how auditions, you know, sit in their audition folder. I, I mean, the, the quicker you get in there, the better chance you have at, at being at the top of the list. So um, definitely, but when it comes down to it, you know, we do say, you know, if you're the right voice for the job, they'll work with you, but being the right voice for the job does have a lot to do with the performance and, and how you hit that script. So, you know, a lot of people do it differently. Um, and you know, it's, it's about honing in on your craft and your voice and your business and delegating. How can I give the best performance and still, you know, get it in as quickly as possible. And, and you're working out your own workflow in getting that to a spot that you're comfortable with. Always remember, you're. Uh, I really like the idea that uh, not just voiceover, voiceover actor. You're an exactly. actor, so like focus on that. Exactly, and and even in in past webinars, I mean, we talk about the conversational read. The conversational read, you're you're being that natural voice, but there's still a certain level of acting that goes into that, right? I mean, it's it's your natural voice. It's your it's your go-to conversational voice, but you're putting yourself into that conversational style. You're you're allowing yourself to, to be that person in a, in a setting that you're not usually in a heightened. Cause it's it, there, there, there's a performance that still comes to it because it's, you've got to be able to get that. Like I'm now like I'm being natural right now, but I'm, I'm also like being excited about what it is I'm saying. So yeah. it's like, you've to, right. You've got to find out, find that balance being to be able to, and, and the, the, to the first question about the conversational read, I was thinking about it afterward and I thought, you know, it, like I, when I'm working with someone, we'll work on that for like four or five sessions of hours, <laughs> four or, five hours or six kind of thing. So yep. that's, I'm sorry, I couldn't answer it right away. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. No okay. worries. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. I'm happy, I'm happy we could both kind of get at that one. Um, and a question from Jake here. Do you have any kind of, you know, by the book do's or don'ts um, when you're auditioning um, that you incorporate in your workflow, like an, any hard stop do's or don'ts that, you know, from day to day audition or audition, you try to follow? Well, I, first of all, what I do is I, I do the reads that I, I do the ones that depending on how much time I have to audition, because I, I, I work a lot. So sometimes I don't have a lot of time to audition but I always go for my wheelhouse reads first. So these are the reads that, these are the, these are the kinds of jobs that I love to do and that I get booked a lot on. So I'll, I'll go for those ones first. And, um, and, and, and I also already have kind of a package of how I'm gonna approach them. Everyone is different, but then so it's gonna have a variation and that's where the, the variation in that is gonna be fun for me. Um, but so that's what I start with. I start with my wheelhouse reads first. 
And then after that, it's like, well, what else do I want to do? If I've got more time, it's like, ooh, this one's really interesting, not necessarily from the point of view of finance. You know, the bigger the budget stuff is like, okay, well, you know, there's going to be 180 people (laughs) that are going to audition for that. Maybe there's something there where like I've been perfecting my South African accent and I want to do that, you know, kind of thing. Maybe that might be something, you know, or I really want to do a character about, you know, being a mermaid and oh, I've got a great mermaid thing. I want to do that. So it, it really depends. Awesome. Awesome. Um, so sorry, I got lost in my list here. So I got to find uh, another question there, which I'm sure will be easy as there's so many. 35 Q&A. <laughs> um, I'll just, I'll pick this one. I haven't read it yet, but um, this is from Franz. Just curious, if you have a voice like Morgan Freeman, would you apply to a middle-aged 35 to 55 age range? Or um, if you really love the script, or would you try to stick to kind of the more, you know, 55 plus? Okay, okay. Voice does not age. I am of an age. And and my <laughs> voice still sounds like it's around 30, 35, right? Um, it it the voice actually does not age. It 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 does slightly after 65. Um, and then female voices go down, they drop down here. And 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 male uh, the male voices kind of pop up there. They kind of pop, and that's the loss of testosterone and the loss of estrogen. But generally, your voice at the age of 18 is going to be very similar to your voice at 60. Um, with a little bit of richening and a little bit of, you know, and, and more control if you've learned how to use your diaphragm. Um, so then it comes more to attitude, a generational attitude, and that's acting. So if you can get that generational attitude, no problem. Morgan Freeman is 83 years old. Nobody thinks of him as that age. They think of him as just, you know, this nice old kind of guy, but you know, <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's awesome. Perfect. <laughs> um, this is a this is a good one and, and definitely touching on the acting part. Um, this is from uh, Rue. Sorry if I said your name wrong there. Um, I've heard that improv classes are a great place to start uh, for voice actors without an acting background. In today's pandemic world, how effective do you think virtual improv classes would be versus in pro or like in person improv? Oh. Um, Absolutely. I mean, it's not gonna it's not gonna be the same because you don't have the same face to face contact. But yes, yes, yes to the improv. Uh, improv helps you stretch your mind and your imagination. It helps gives you confidence. It's that whole notion of yes and another the, the flip side of that that I also think is very important for people to, and I strongly encourage anyone who, who has the inclination to explore is stand up comedy um, because whereas improv is yes and stand up comedy is no limitation restriction control and that's a very interesting kind of exploration as well but yeah go for the improv and even if it's on zoom right now do it anyway i am teaching a college level course in voice acting every week on zoom since september and we're doing just fine so um, I've got a really good question and, and I'm sure this is probably, um, shared by a lot of people. Um, if you find yourself, this is from Linda, by the way, if you find yourself getting, um, many likes on auditions, but you're not getting over that gold line, you're not booking that job. What would be your suggestion? What would be your takeaway from something like that? Okay. So close, but no cigar is a hard place to be. Um, and, and so what you, what, what I would do is I would, um, I, I, okay. Um, if you can find out who booked the job, listen to their job. That's not very easy to do. Um, unless it's like a commercial or something that is, you know, um, and just see if you can listen to the difference. Um, but again, I think I would probably go back to either either work with a coach on sorting out your reads um, and or um, uh, uh, go to that top 100 and listen to the people who are booking or the recently, you can do the recently who recently booked because that means that they've done, they're doing something right as well. Um, but also just know that, you know, there's a certain, it's, it, 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 I hate to say it's a numbers game, but it, there, there are going to be times when, you know, you're close, you're so close, but you're not quite there. Keep doing it. Keep doing it. You're doing something right. If you're getting the thumbs up, just work more on your connection with the script and the connection with the person you're talking to. I really, really think that'll help. Definitely. And I, I, I think when you're getting those likes, um, this is something that I, I chat with a lot of talent about is exactly like Kim said, you're doing something right. 
you're, you're in consideration for the job. So don't try to reinvent the wheel, you know, try to listen to those reads, try to listen to those likes and say, okay, what, what might've pushed over the goal line. And, and even within those, um, there are certain times where maybe it was just a creative decision. Maybe, you know, it was open to both male and female and you were a male and they chose a female. So, so don't take it too harshly. Take the positive that you're doing something very much right and listen to those reads and, and try to hone in on, you know, if you think there could be any improvements there. Would you agree with that, Kim? I totally would. And, you know, it's like we, we, you really have to have a, you really have to kind of go audition. Great. Do the freaking best job you possibly can and let it go. Just don't even care whether you got it or not. If you've done the best job you possibly can, you have made an impact. You've done your work. You will book at certain point. If you're doing the best job you can, and if you're not booking after a while, then go to get go go to a professional. Get a get some coaching. You're probably like, you know, maybe a little tweak away from really booking. True. Hmm. All right. Um, let me find another one here. All right. Um, this is a long one, so I'll try to condense it and I hope I catch um, kind of the gist of it there. Uh, this is from Deborah, and she wonders how do you, um, what's the best way you find to kind of find the balance um, of the energy you put into your reads, like in regards to, you know, being too excited or not excited enough? How do you try to, you know, try to find that level that you, you would deem the sweet spot there? I think a lot of that that part of the question has to do with 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 the the the, the client. Okay, so like is the client that, that that will inform how much energy you should give to something, uh, and and the script itself. You know, um, are they asking for you know have they have they tagged it with a you know high energy read or not? Um, have they, you know, uh, it's an actor's choice. You hear this a lot in acting, the actor's choice. Um, so there's a lot of work that you have to do to be able to get to that point, but, you know, think of the client. Um, if, if you're not sure, go and hunt down commercials or corporate narrations or whatever it is that you're booking, uh, looking to book, um, that they have already done. Go to YouTube. It's a great resource. Uh, see what they've done and go like, oh, they're kind of a bank with a real kind of quirky sense of humor, or they're a real kind of low key kind of thing. You know, you if you can get an idea from what they've already done, that'll help you figure out what how high or low to put the energy. I think that's a, a really good and and that's typically what I suggest is find find what their brand sound is. You know, yes. they, are they that fun and exciting? You know, really kind of high pace. You know, brand or are they more Kind of you know the the cool calm collected you know kind of brand so um definitely i think that's good advice there um and now i do think i missed the spot a little bit on what she was trying to say there so um she did have a couple questions in there so i will also say um when it comes to uh doing the technological side of you know audacity or whatever editing software you're doing how do you balance your time in um auditioning and doing the um kind of post post-production there do you kind of do all of your auditions at once then do the post-production do you do them one at a time how do you wear both hats and what would be your suggestion to somebody who's a novice um you know okay yes okay so at this point in, at this point in the in my I don't necessarily have a lot of time to audition so I'll do one complete audition at once uh I'll do it I'll do it I'll edit it I'll send it off boom it's out but um earlier on on the earlier in my my life <laughs> um i would record everything i would record 10 auditions at once and then i would go and i would edit everything and then i would you know press i've got a couple of presets for eq and effects and stuff like that and i would just go press 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 and i drop down markers and label them and then you know split the mark get the split by marker so all of the auditions would come up at once uh there's a, a nice little um uh thing it's called uh what is it called it's um uh, a, a, a uh, an extension you can get um it's called what's it called uh start link selection it's called it's there's a link you can get it's a little extension i'll, I'll have i'll find it out and 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 give it to you afterward because it's for some reason it's not letting me see the extension um 
that you can put down and it just sort of like lets you open like a whole bunch of jobs at once. Um, and uh, so then you can go through your list and, and you, you know, you've got your like your 10 that you're looking at on the template and you go this one, this one, this one, and you click and it opens all of them at once. So there's like little shortcuts that you can find to be able to help speed up your process. Definitely. There's a question. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Um, I do have a question there and um, this will be our last question of the day here. So I know this fairly general, but at the same time, it is very important question. Um, how important is it to find your niche and to get a grounding in that, in that niche? I think it's the difference between booking occasionally and turning it into a career. That's how important it is. I would agree yeah. with that. You know, I mean, I would love to do animation and gaming and I have done a little bit here and there, but that's not my wheelhouse. I am commercials, narration, e-learning, corporate explainers. That's what I do. That's what I book a ton of. And so it makes sense for me to spend more time. Now, I'll still learn about animation and gaming because it's kind of like fun to do one every once in a while, do an audio book once in a while. One, I won a Sobis Award for an audio book, which is kind of cool. Um, but my wheelhouse, I know what it is. And I will learn more and more and more about that. That is what I work on and continue to work on and continue, thankfully, to love. So, yeah, that's what I do. Yeah, I would completely agree that it, it sets you apart from, you know, possibly doing this part time or, or as a hobby, you know, to being able to, you know, take this into a full time career. And not only that, even from your day to day, you know, the time you're spending auditioning, if you know what your niche is, then yeah. you can all of a sudden take your booking ratio to, to new heights that you might not have thought of before because you know when you're auditioning to those jobs that you have a good chance. Exactly, and, and it's all about money too, right? Your time is your money. Um, so if you you can shortcut it, I, I was talking to the, a, a director of video games and he was saying, when you're auditioning for video games, go for the ones that you already already book. The, if, you're, if you're always the spear carrier, go for the spear carrier. If you're don't, because they don't want, they don't want you to try for everything else. They there's a reason you're booking one thing over and over again, because you're good at it. So yep. stick with that. And then the other stuff is gravy. Yeah, exactly. Take that as your extra time and, and your spare time and, and play around there. Fun projects. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Alrighty guys, it is two o'clock. So um, we'll be wrapping up uh, any questions I did not get to. I do apologize. Um, and if you have any questions for um, Kim that you, you would like to reach out to um, it's Kim at Kim handy voiceover.com, right? It's that one. They're also, um, you can, my, my direct email is kimhandysides at gmail.com. Don't okay, tell perfect. me else. <laughs> <laughs> All righty guys. So you got it there. Um, feel free to reach out to her. As I said, this is recorded. So it will be sent out to everybody about 24 hours. So that way you guys can watch it, watch it uh, as needed. Um, if you have any other questions more related to uh, voices.com, feel free to reach out to uh, support at voices.com. We're always happy to answer any questions you guys have. Um, and aside from that, thank you so much, Kim. It was really great seeing okay. you again. It'll be my pleasure, Kyle. After this. It's always, right. always a great time connecting. I know, I know. I love you too. <laughs> <laughs> oh, geez. All right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, thank you so much. It, it really is appreciated. Um, and everybody who carved time out of their day to do this, um, thank you very much for coming. Um, and other than that, we'll see you guys next month with the next webinar. Bye. See you, Kim.